They had known him his whole life. Isaac was their friend's younger brother. And when they would come over, Isaac would always be there, lying on a mat. He was paralyzed from the neck down. He couldn't walk the dog, couldn't jog the neighborhood, couldn't go to school, couldn't work a job. He couldn't even feed himself. I mean, he had no life. Their physicians couldn't do anything for him. Well, one of them heard about Jesus, that he healed people. And so the four friends said, let's take Isaac to Jesus. So they put him on a stretcher and off they went. When they rounded the turn into town, Capernaum, everything about the picture spelled impossibility. I mean, Jesus was speaking at a house, and it was a large house, but it was just packed. And every window had like two or three people sitting in the windowsill, and the front door was just crammed with people all the way out into the street. So there's no way they could get their friend to Jesus. Religious leaders had come down from uh, Jerusalem. They turned this whole deal into a major event. I mean, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen, but nobody wanted to miss the face-off between Jesus and the religious leaders. I wish I could have been there to hear them talk. What are we going to do? How are we going to get Isaac to Jesus? One of them said, well, let's form a wedge like the Romans do. We'll lock arms and we'll just drive him right into Jesus. And one of the four friends says, no, nah, I don't think Jesus would like that. doesn't like men knocking over children, knocking down people. Another one says, well, let's go the roof route. See, this, we'll take those stairs up, we'll get on top of the roof, we'll remove some tiles, and we'll lower him down where Jesus is speaking. I mean, it was a risky plan. Most homeowners don't like to have their roofs disassembled. And teachers don't like to be interrupted. I mean, they talked about it and ultimately they went with the roof plan. So most roofs in Palestine in the first century were made of mud and twigs, branches. But this was a tile roof. That means... Uh, the Romans introduced tile roofs, so that means this was a wealthy person. The owner was busting with pride to have Jesus in his house. I mean, word had spread that Jesus healed a, a man with leprosy. He thought, wow, if, we could, if Jesus could just heal all the people with leprosy and we could get rid of those God-forsaken lep leper colonies... He would solve a huge problem in Palestine. And it was not every day that you had religious leaders down from Jerusalem. They didn't, they didn't come to Capernaum often. So as he was standing there, he noticed a little bit of light shining through his roof. He thought, that's odd. I just put the roof on there. I'll have to get that fixed before the rains come. And then it got a little bigger. And dust started coming down and pieces of mortar. And then he could see what was going on. All of a sudden, four faces looked down in. And they saw where Jesus was teaching. So they, they took some tiles off to, so they could lower Isaac down. And when they lowered him down in front of Jesus, Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. The four guys are saying, No, 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 Jesus, paralyzed. What are you thinking, Jesus? Paralyzed people don't sin much. They don't need to be forgiven. He needs to be healed. Paralyzed. <laughs> and the religious leaders, they were thinking, this is blasphemy. Why does Jesus talk this way? Who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, 
said, so you don't think I can forgive sins? To show you that I can forgive sins, I'll heal this man. So he turned to him and says, rise up, take your mat and go home. Well, that was the moment of truth. Could he get up? Would he even try? He looked at his friends and they're saying, go, go, Isaac, you can do this. He looked at Jesus. I mean, he didn't have any muscles. Those were gone years ago. And he began to strain with all the strength that he had. And all of a sudden, his bones and his joints sprung to life and he got up and he walked out in front of everybody. And all the people said, whoa, this is amazing. All the people praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. No people who put their faith in Jesus are disappointed. Have you put your faith in Jesus? To know Jesus requires faith. Hebrews 11.6 informs us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The more you put your faith in Jesus, the more you see that Jesus really is the Son of God, the powerful creator of the universe. Let's read this story together. It's Mark chapter 2. If you'd like to use the Bibles we have under the seats in front of you, uh, it's the uh, second gospel, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Why don't you read it with me? A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now this is the, uh, sparked the, uh, the series, Profound Questions Jesus Asked. This is one of Jesus' profound questions. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed, and go home? Which do you think is easier to say? Yeah, I think so. Your sins are forgiven. Can't prove whether he did it or not. So, but I want you to know, Jesus says, let's, let's keep reading together. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for that man that day. You healed him and you forgave his sins. And the religious leaders considered that blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God? But that was just your point, that you are God. You are the Son of God. You're the creator of the universe. Help us understand that today as we look at this who you really are and why we can put our faith in you and may we learn to put our faith in you more than when we came this morning. We're ready to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. To know Jesus requires faith. What do we learn from this account about faith? I find at least four things. One, faith in Jesus can be difficult. The four friends decided to carry Jesus on a stretcher to the man. I imagine by the time they got there, their arms were dying. 
And then when they got there and saw the crowd all around the house, they thought this is impossible to get our friend to Jesus. It's still difficult to believe in Jesus today. You look at shows on TV, movies, our schools, our universities, everywhere we look, we're told not to believe in Jesus. Jesus looks for people who are willing to take a gamble on him. When I went to Lewis and Clark College, uh, I worked uh, with Young Life at Lake Oswego High School. Then when I went to seminary in Chicago, I came back and for a short time, I again worked with youth in Lake Oswego. And I learned pretty quickly that not very many teenagers in Lake Oswego went to church. And there weren't many people working with them, youth pastors or Young Life or Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It just, they, the kids were not going. And uh, so there were lots of kids in Lake Oswego that needed Jesus, but nobody was really taking them to him taking Jesus to them. I had learned that uh, principals in Lake Oswego at Lake Ridge and Lake Oswego did not allow uh, youth leaders uh, on campus. But like the four friends that brought their paralyzed uh, uh, friend, uh, I wasn't going to give up and not even try. So I made an appointment with the principal at Lake Oswego High School. So let me give you a little context for what it was like when I went in. Uh, like most youth leaders at that time, I had long hair. Now tell me, would you hire me as your youth pastor? <laughs> so I got dressed that morning and uh, I decided that I would wear my spiffy blue and tan suede shoes. Remember those? Not, not all of you were, uh, lived during Abraham Lincoln's time like I did, but you know, we used to, we used to wear those. And uh, so I went in and when I came into the principal's office, the first thing I noticed was that he was wearing blue and tan suede shoes. And I'm sure that's the first thing he noticed about me. So we sat there for a while and just talked about how cool we were wearing our shoes. Then we got talking about his school and kids and, and I said, you know, it would really help us as leaders if we're gonna help teenage kids to um, um, be able to come on campus, you know, lunch and different times and talk to kids. And it would really help if we had passes to all the sporting events because, you know, our leaders were all poor. And uh, he immediately got us passes and said, you can come on campus anytime you want. And other people were shocked when I reported this news. That, but I wasn't that surprised. God is a big God. And I knew he wanted kids in Lake Oswego to know Jesus and that he would help us figure out a way to do that. When we put our faith in Jesus, uh, we're never disappointed. I went afraid, but it, with faith in Jesus. To know Jesus requires faith. Second thing, faith in Jesus may not be politically correct. It was not politically correct to climb upon a roof and remove tiles. It wasn't politically correct to be so uh, bold that you uh, basically break into a house to get your friend to Jesus. It wasn't politically correct to interrupt Jesus and the religious leaders. It's not politically correct today to believe in Jesus. If you do, you're supposed to keep to yourself. In middle school, high school, college, you're not supposed to speak out that you believe in Jesus. That's not cool. Maybe you work with engineers or scientists or medical prof professionals. They've been steeped in the thinking that science and evolution answers all our questions today. We don't need God anymore. And if you have faith, you don't talk about it because most people believe all religions are the same. So it's not politically correct to say that one faith might be more true than another. It's not politically correct to believe in Jesus. It's certainly not acceptable to be fully devoted to Jesus. You're not supposed to be white hot in your commitment and to step out into the unknown. I came across this remarkable letter written 200 years ago by Martin Van Buren. He's the, he was the eighth president of the United States. He was writing the letter to 
President Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. The contents, a critical warning that the evil new railroads would uh, disrupt business, cause a lot of unemployment, and uh, uh, be too costly. Listen to the letter. January 31st, 1829. Dear President Jackson, the canal system of this country is being threatened by the spread of a new form of transportation known as railroads. The federal government must preserve the canals for the following reasons. One, if the canal boats are supplanted by railroads, serious unemployment will result. Captains, cooks, drivers, repairmen, and lock tenders will be left without means of livelihood, not to mention the numerous farmers now employed in growing hay for horses. Boat builders, too. Boat builders will suffer, and tow line, whip, and harness makers will be left destitute. Three, canal boats are absolutely essential to the defense of the United States. In the event of the expected trouble with England, the Erie Canal would be the only means by which we could ever move the supplies so vital to waging modern war. As you may well know, Mr. President, railroad carriages are pulled at the enormous speed of 15 miles per hour by engines which, in addition to endangering life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fire to crops, scaring children, frightening women, and scaring livestock. The Almighty certainly never intended that people should travel at such breakneck speeds. <laughs> Don't shrink back from putting your faith in Jesus Christ just because it's a journey into the unknown and politically incorrect. To know Jesus requires faith. Three, faith in Jesus as the Son of God makes the best sense. When the four friends lowered their uh, paralyzed friend into, uh, to where Jesus was teaching, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. The friends were prepared to see Jesus heal, but not to see him offer forgiveness for sins. The Jewish scribes and the leaders from Jerusalem that had come to Capernaum were seated there and they began grumbling, why does this man talk like this? This is blasphemous. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They picked up on Jesus' inference right away that he was claiming to be the Son of God. Now, Bill and Mamie, uh, I had the privilege of marrying you a little over a year ago. How's the marriage going? You guys ever had a fight? <laughs> All right, so I, I know probably how it went. You probably did something stupid. Probably made a decision without consulting with Mamie and maybe you were a little insensitive and you got mad, right? About how it went? All right, suppose I drop by your house and you're in the middle of, middle of a big row. And I hear it. And uh, so I come in and I say, Bill, I forgive you. And you're thinking, what are you doing? You can't forgive him. I'm the only one that can forgive him for his stupid whatever he did. <coughs> right? I can't come in and, and forgive him. The only person who can, besides you, that can meaningfully forgive Bill is God, right? Because God made us all, and he's the one that set up all the moral standards for the universe. All, all, all morals are based on his holy character, so he's the only one besides you that could forgive Bill. So that's what Jesus did. He comes in and forgives this man, and his clear inference is that he's claiming to be God. The religious leaders knew that. Jesus knew that the Jewish scribes didn't believe he was the Son of God and had authority to forgive sins. So to prove he had the authority, he healed the man. He asked them, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your mat and walk? And this is the series, profound questions Jesus asked. And this is one of the questions Jesus asked. Now obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Nobody. I mean, words are cheap. Nobody can prove whether your sins have just been forgiven or not, right? You can't verify that. So Jesus says, I'll demonstrate to you that I have the authority to forgive sins. That by showing that I have the power to heal as well. You can verify that. I'll give you verifiable proof to substantiate my unverifiable claims. 
The argument was crystal, crystal clear to the Jewish scribes. It went like this. Forgiveness of sins comes from God alone. Jesus claimed to forgive sins. Jesus healed the man to demonstrate his authority to forgive sins. Therefore, Jesus claimed to be God. Much as they didn't want to admit it, the religious leaders learned that when you meet Jesus, you meet God. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus used miracles in the physical realm to substantiate his claims in the spiritual realm. He says, I am the bread of life. And then he feeds the 5,000. He says, I am the light of the world. And then he heals the blind man. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Then he raises Lazarus from the dead. And then ultimately, he is raised from the dead. When we share Christ with our family, friends, associates, classmates, we have every, they have every right to expect that we'll give them good, solid evidence why they can believe in Jesus too. And that's exactly what Mark does for us here. How do we know Jesus is God? Maybe you believe that Jesus is God, but how do you know that he really is? We could point to things like his miracles, but other people did miracles too. So while miracles may be indicative, they're not decisive. Of course, the resurrection is the ultimate vindication that Jesus is God as he claimed to be. But besides the resurrection, I think the most striking thing he did to indicate that he is the Son of God was forgiving sins. If you do something against me, I might forgive you. But nobody else can step in and say, I forgive you. The only person that can do that is God himself. So along comes Jesus and he says, I forgive you. The religious people understood immediately that this was a claim to be God. This was one of the most striking ways that he made the claim to be God. Not only did Jesus forgive sins, but he also asserted that he himself was without sin. Uh, sinlessness is an attribute of God. Throughout history, people that have uh, seemed to be the most holy are also people that are most conscious of their shortcomings, their sins, their lusts, their resentments. But along comes Jesus, who can stay with a straight face, which of you can convict me of sin? Now, if I said that, Jory and Erica, my family, would be the first to stand up and say, yeah, we'll testify against Dad. <laughs> so his claim to forgive sins and to be sinless are two of the greatest evidences that he really is the Son of God. Fourth thing, faith in Jesus is rewarded. The four friends who brought the paralyzed man to Jesus were rewarded for their faith. Jesus did more than they ever hoped he could. The paralyzed man was rewarded for his faith in allowing them to bring him to Jesus. Many people became believers that day. They were rewarded for their faith by having their lives changed forever. All of them went out excited to tell other people what they saw. No one who puts their faith in Jesus is ever the same. Have you put your faith in him? Randy Elkarn, the author, tells about uh, a man named Assam Yoni in the mountains of Southeast Asia. He was a local witch doctor. He... Uh, claimed to have 50 decapitated heads buried in the backyard. He was the leader of the village because I guess whoever has the most heads has the most influence. Uh, the Jesus film came to town, and, uh, but he refused to go. The Jesus film is uh, the movie about Jesus according to the book of Matthew. And many people have become Christians seeing that movie. The movie uh, is, has been translated into many, many languages. And, uh, and so many people have seen a movie for the first time in their life. 
in their language. He refused to go, but his 73-year-old mother went. She saw the movie about Jesus and saw his claims and the people he healed. And she didn't make a commitment of faith that night. But three weeks later, she fell off a bamboo ladder and she was paralyzed. And so she called the pastor who had, uh, from the area who had brought the film into town. And he came and sitting on her bedside, he said, you know, Jesus can forgive your sins and he can heal you. And so she put her faith in Christ and she was healed that day. But her son continued to be hard-hearted, had no interest in Christ. But she attended a, a, a life training course that, that came kind of with the Bible project. And she learned that if she prayed for her son, they, that God could convict him and draw him. One day the son was, just got to thinking, if somebody cut off my head, would I know for sure that I'd go to heaven? And so he called the same pastor that had talked to his mom and he came and they talked for like two hours. And the witch doctor put his faith in Christ. He still had prestige in the town, and so he called all the members of the village, 1,008, together, and he told them how he had just committed his life to Jesus Christ, that he believed Jesus was the Son of God. And every person there committed their lives to Christ too. One person made a commitment to Christ, and soon the whole village was changed. No one who puts their faith in Jesus is ever the same. To know Jesus requires faith. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you can forgive sins and you demonstrate that you can forgive sins by healing people. And Father, we, uh, and Lord Jesus, we uh, today come to a deeper faith that you are the Son of God than when we came this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to pray. Maybe you have never committed your life to Jesus Christ. You, you know, maybe you haven't been convinced that he's the Son of God, but maybe today you say, you know what? I do believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God. Thank you for dying for my sins. I want you to forgive me. Would you come into my life? You could pray that right now. Others of you, maybe you... I've already committed your life to Christ, but maybe you want to tell him today, you know what, I'm more convinced that you're the Son of God than I was when I arrived this morning, and I want to put more faith in you to realize if you live in me, I've got the very God of the universe living inside of me, and I should be expecting more things in my life, more miracles, more amazing things. You pray too. I'll give you all about a minute to pray, okay? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can not only believe but know that you're the Son of God and put our faith in you and see you do great things in our lives, in our families, even in our whole country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.